my thought, I mean, I could justify the, the talk I'm going to give is, oh, well, you know, it, it's going to be the last one. I'll do something that's a bit consolidating rather than jam more content at you. But I think I was always going to do that anyway. Um, it's always just a good excuse to show some pictures of animals. But what I would invite you to do is uh, listen perhaps more for the questions and whether they're relevant for you and just ignore everything else that I'm going to say. Uh, because what I just... I wanted to finish on a note where it was a chance for you to reflect, well, what are you getting out of this? What's this mean for you? And how can we bring all this stuff back together? Because hopefully you've had a great time, you've had some great thoughts, and by the time you get to your first set of lights after the workshop, half of what you got excited about has gone. It's true. <laughs> so how do we consolidate this stuff? You know, like how do we... How do we find our grounding points of when in doubt, what do we come back to? And um, the idea for, for what I'm going to present actually came from a conversation with Steve when we were organising um, the symposium in the first place. And Steve had a throwaway line, which as you'll now realise, he's got quite a lot of throwaway lines. And he just wonders about things. And he was wondering about what role do clients have in training? And maybe there's a bit more that we could do there. And it got me thinking that there's some people here who've done some fantastic work with, um, as Eileen was talking about, actors and uh, Kylie, that that would so enrich our training. Often we don't have the funding for that. But then it got me thinking, hang on a minute, we've got a room full of clients because we are all clients. And how can we learn from that? How can we learn from the fact that we're all clients, our loved ones are clients, and different kinds of clients, clients of different kinds of services, sometimes under duress, sometimes willingly. But how do we learn from that without just making it all about us? Because we know how we can do that. We go, ah, what's really important is, because that's what would work for me. So in my world, every health practitioner would be hilarious. <laughs> It's not going to work for everyone. And we all know that we have to tone that down when we're working with some people or we ramp it up or we find a space that's right for that person. So it just kind of got me thinking of what are some of the grounding principles. So if you don't listen to anything else I say, I think it's just a good question. How do we learn from being a client without making it about ourselves? And my starting point was how do we actually know ourselves? And I'm not sure that everyone in the room is going, right, I want to subject myself to the battery of assessment that we subject our clients to or are required sometimes to subject ourselves to. But the better we can know ourselves, the better we understand half of the relationship that we're inviting people into. So for myself, um, anyone, and it's so lovely to see there's so many faces in the room of people I've trained, people I've worked with, um, which is just really cool. But anyone who's had me as a trainer will know something about me, which is no matter how hard I try, there's something I can't change about myself. And that is that if I had an animal totem, I would be the crazy hamster. <laughs> and this came from, I was in Seattle many years ago. I went to, they've got a night zoo inside the zoo, which is where they trick the animals and they turn out the lights during the day and they turn them on when we all go home so that we can see what the night animals get up to. So I went into this zoo and your eyes adjust. And there was, you know, there was the, you know, thing up in a tree having a stretch and scratching his nuts and then there was the one going off foraging and then there was the one going off and doing whatever. And then suddenly this little hamster ran out and there was a tree in the enclosure. There's this little tree and this hamster just came, ran out and just went round and round and round and round and round the base of this tree and <laughs> disappeared. And then he came back, back, round and round and round and round and round and round and round the base of this tree, disappeared. And while obviously we're all thinking mm, the inhumanity of Zeus might come to mind because clearly he had gone completely mad, what I was also thinking was Oh, I've got a soulmate out there. Because <laughs> that's me. And, you know, I often will say, you know, MI keeps me honest. MI doesn't make me this fabulous, wonderful, you know, logical, grounded, respectful person that I was drawn to MI to hang out with. I'm still the crazy hamster. But it kind of, when in doubt, it kind of helps take me in a, 
in a good direction. So it's not so, perhaps so much that my aim is to stop being a crazy hamster. I'm still working on slowing down <laughs> when I speak. And there is one person in this room who's managed to help me achieve that, and that's Huey. <laughs> when I ran some training in Beijing, and I had to stop after every sentence so he could translate for me. Yeah, that's the only way I've ever been slowed down. So maybe it's not so much I shouldn't be a crazy hamster, but I sure as hell need to know that when I'm working with someone, that that's my default setting. And that I will have five on a good day, 10 plus trains of thought going at any one time. I will pick up the pace. When I get anxious, bang, bullet train. You know, makes the, the one to Tokyo look slow. <laughs> I'm not saying it's good. I'm just saying it's fast. So I just need to know that. I need to know what my default settings are. And curiosity, I think the more we're investing in curiosity, the less likely we'll get caught up in our assumptions. But isn't that easier said than done when we're tired, when we're frustrated? Or even if we've got a fantastic relationship with the client that we're working with, but we've worked with them for a really long time and we can feel like we know them. We might forget to ask something. We might forget. So sometimes it's that trick of how do we learn the skills of not just how do we be curious, but how do we regain curiosity? How do we check in with how we're going with our curiosity? Uh, and maybe we need some strategies on how we regain curiosity. And one of the best ones I've ever found is how do I find a question I don't know the answer to? And sometimes that just comes from talking to someone else and supervision and, you know, they ask me something about, oh, how do they feel about the blah, blah? And I'm like, I've got no idea. When in doubt, be curious, what's this person's theory of how change is supposed to happen? We might not have talked about that. So how do we, how do we stay curious? And part of curiosity leads into how do we listen? How do we listen better? How do we listen deeper? And I think... One of our strategies for that is reflections. Now, we know that reflections are beautifully connected to expressing accurate empathy and blah, blah. It's all really nice stuff. But they're also so practical just in helping keeping us there in the moment. Because if we know our count that we're looking for around two, three reflections for every question as a sort of rough guideline, we know we need to reflect fairly often, in which case, damn, we better listen so that we've got something to reflect. And then we get the idea, maybe it's not just enough to repeat what they're saying. We want to reflect meaning. We want to reflect more depth. We want to do more complex reflections and simple reflections. So how do we listen deeper? And reflections help us to do that. And making a reflection is only half of it. So one part is also just, I guess, to take a step back, maybe there's three parts to reflections. The first is forming it. Because maybe you don't get to say it. Maybe it's not actually the right time for you to speak. But forming it means you're tuning in and you're listening hard and thinking, how do I keep making a better and better and a deeper and deeper reflection based on this story that's unfolding? So forming it, then saying it, but we're still not done because the next part is watching like mad, how did it go? Because how do we know? So one, we're going to get the chance to clarify. Now, again, some of you who know me as a trainer will know sometimes I'm a little bit naughty. If we've you know, got a good connection in the room and someone might ask me something like, well, what happens if you get your reflections wrong? And if we've got a really good vibe in the room, I might do something I would never do with a client and I'm going to be a little bit cheeky and just very deliberately get the next reflection very wrong. And I'll say something like, oh, so it's like, um, what happens if you're talking to a client who doesn't know what they're talking about? Like, that's a completely inaccurate reflection. And usually most times people would say, no, no, it's not that. I say, oh, I'm sorry, I think I've misunderstood. And uh, tell me what you really mean. Okay, so it's more about this and we just reconnect and recalibrate. Sometimes people are really kind to me and they don't have the heart to tell me in front of a group of people that I'm just really stuffed up and I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. But I have yet to see, or have yet not to see something happen when I do a really wrong reflection is this little... Thing, passes it flickers across the face. It's like it's like a little confused puppy look, or you know. And then I go, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. But if I'm really tuned in and I'm looking for the 
hypothesis I'm getting wrong as well as the hypothesis I'm getting right, maybe I might pick up on that even if they couldn't directly tell me how and you're an idiot. <laughs> That's not what I said at all. Pay attention. Which takes me to my next one, um, which I think is really important. How do we learn from our, being a client without making it about ourselves is this idea of responsiveness. And it's kind of interesting that, I don't know, has anyone ever had specific training where the whole and sole focus of that part of a training and your exercises were just purely on how do you be more responsive to the person in front of you. I'm guessing not that often. So how do we get more flexible? How do we learn to tune that dial while also holding the other half of the picture, which is we want to be guided by core values and principles and we want to be consistent because that's one of the ways that we are authentic. It's also one of the ways we are in that therapeutic space. We know that the art of being a good helper is not the art of automatic reactions, it's the art of conscious responses. And then how do we just keep fine tuning that? How do we tune that in to the frequency of the person in front of us rather than hope that they catch on our frequency and listen to our radio station? And the capacity to be surprised is one of the most joyful things, but it's one of those real Unfortunate things when you get better and better at what you do or you learn more and more about what you do. If you remember what it was like on your first job and you probably had that thought, gee, I'm so looking forward to the day that I know what the hell I'm doing. And you're thinking that in the meantime someone might catch you out. And you, you know, this idea of this fabulous professionalism that you're going to have one day and this knowledge and there's this sort of like holy grail of security and comfort that seems to come with that. Unfortunately, when we get there, one, we realise we didn't get there because we never will. But the other is it just comes with new assumptions. I remember working with a, a woman, um, just, every, just this is so simple story. I was working with a woman, we're talking about her heroin use and it was... Session five, by the time I realised that she wasn't injecting, she was smoking because at that period nearly everyone was injecting it, such a little thing. But I forgot to ask. You know, say, so how did, because in doing the work more and more, I started getting assumptions, I started getting expectations about the work. So, how do we maintain that capacity to be surprised and protect that? because that would be a damn shame to miss out on some of those surprises. <laughs> I just love that. I, for some reason, I could look at this all day and still find it funny. <laughs> I think I just revealed too much about myself. I'm a crazy hamster and I have a very... OK, I'm easily amused. <laughs> Anyone in the room who's been to my training will know that as well. Um, and then just finally, it's nice to tie in with a point that Kelly made. Um, we're actually talking about hard stuff, aren't we? We're not talking about, oh, great, I get to memorise all of these questions and memorise all these reflections and then I'm going to be totally awesome. Damn it, I'm the one who has to be totally awesome. Like, I've got to be a bit zen-like amazing here to be empty mind, the clutter. I don't know how to quite get... I was, ran into a woman on a tram the other day. She was reading a book on how to tame... A wild, how, to, how to tame your elephant or how to tame your inner elephant or something. And I'm like, is it good? Because I've got a whole herd of them up here. <laughs> but, you know, we, we know that we're going to do our best work. We're going to be most likely to be open, curious, tuned in, responsive, able to be surprised, be there right there in that moment with that person when we're feeling fresh and we're feeling calm and relaxed and it does come back to the sleep. And the, how many people in the room... You don't have to say anything about how it happened. Who's had that smell of burnout? Who's had that taste of burnout? In You know, like I'm constantly, yeah, everyone probably in some ways. I'm famous for sailing right past, like I'm in the middle of the bushfire before I've gone, okay, time to take a break. But how do we just protect that? Because I think MI does come at the fundamental is that this comes from good relationships, which means really how do we protect the half of the relationship that we're in touch with every single day, which is us? How do we be calm? How do we be open? And how do we be curious about our own experiences? 
How do we learn from being a client in a way that we can use that to tune in to the other person rather than to make assumptions about the other person? Thank you. That was all I had to say.